Hello and welcome to The Cutting Room, the movie show from All The Right Movies. I'm John and with me today are Luke. Hello. And Westy. Hello. This episode, we're in the biggest genre currently out there. It's superheroes and supervillains as we talk Christopher Nolan's seminal sequel, The Dark Knight. Yeah. A modern classic for me, this one. But why do you want to talk about it, Westy? It's a modern classic for me as well. That's probably why. It's one of them films that I just keep coming back to, that I keep enjoying, that I keep finding things with, that I keep getting excited about. Mm-hmm. That I just can't believe how big it is and how how well made it is, or mm. how well you know how brilliant it, it all comes together. It's one of them films where you can put it on and really take it seriously. You can kind of sit with someone and go, "Oh, I don't like superhero films. I don't like Batman films." <laughs> well, watch this. Yes, you do. <laughs> and you kind of go, you know, Batman's not even the real character in this. There's so many other <laughs> colourful characters. It's just a fantastic film that I'll never tire of. And I'm yeah, I'm really excited to talk about it. It's it's just yeah, it's a great piece of work. Yeah, I remember this coming out back in 2008, still really vividly. There was a massive online marketing campaign beforehand, I remember, one of the first viral marketing strategies, which has been common for movies since. And when it landed, it seemed to be an instant classic, even at the time. It was, I think, the film that made Christopher Nolan the biggest event movie maker this century, features Mm. possibly the most talked about acting performance this century. And Mm -hmm. according to some online platforms like IMDb's Top 250, it's the best film this century so we'll be talking about all of that and there's loads more to get into as well about the making of behind the scenes so pretty big one this i think yeah yeah huge. the biggest mm. and look the dark knight for you yeah um well it's my favorite comic book adaptation by a mile but you know that's not much to go off because that's a <laughs> no, path no, least traveled one you've me. seen <laughs> yeah, yeah the only one i've seen so yeah it's top of the list <laughs> <laughs> best and the worst yeah <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing it when it came out, I mean, uh, like you, John, but I was under considerable duress to go and see it because it's not really a genre that I I absolutely love or know too well. Mm -hmm. But once that opening bank heist starts, I'm all in. And I came out of the theatre claiming this to be one of my favourite films, one of the best films I've I've ever seen. I mean, (laughs) the dust has settled a little bit over the last 14 years. (laughs) Um, And although I don't feel exactly the same about it, I still hold it in high regard. One thing is for sure. It's a pretty amazing film and and one that I'm looking forward to revisiting with you guys. Great. Well, a freak in a cheap suit wants to watch the world burn. We're in Gotham to talk The Dark Knight. And here we go. Having spent nine months fighting crime, Batman has the Gotham hoodlums under control, but when a criminal mastermind calling himself the Joker takes over the underworld, Batman is pushed to his ethical limit in saving the city from chaos. Likes to laugh though, the Joker, doesn't he? He's all right, isn't he? That's brilliant. (laughs) Directed by Christopher Nolan and written by Nolan, Jonathan Nolan and David S. Goyer, The Dark Knight was produced by Warner Brothers and stars in the lead roles, Christian Bale as Batman, Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent, and Heath Ledger as the Joker. So The Cutting Room is a show where we break films down into their key parts to talk about them, and in The Dark Knight, we're going to be talking about the director, the writing, the cast, and our own highlights, and then we'll each give the film a rating out of 10. Sounds good. Right then, first things first, it's the director of The Dark Knight, it's Christopher Nolan. The Dark Knight was Northern's sixth movie as director, and he had made big budget films before. He said there were two main factors that interested him in The Dark Knight. First, he'd never made a sequel before. The Dark Knight followed on from Batman Begins, and Northern saw that as a new challenge. And The Joker. Northern felt like he knew what to do with that character. Hmm. So there were some expectations on him here. But how did he do as a director, Luke? I mean, you know, very well. Yeah, he's done all right. Yeah. Um, What I really love about his work is um, the pacing and the non-stop, what feel like non-stop set pieces that Nolan just drops in to make like a hefty runtime really fly over. Mm. Um, Obviously, the opening scene, the editing and the frenetic energy, that's off the chain. And then every, say, 20, 25 minutes, there are these like huge tempo moments where he intercuts, say, two or three different threads together. Like, for example, like that sequence where the judge, the commissioner, and Harvey Dent's DNA are all found on the Joker card. Amazing stuff. 
all in the cut, the ticking music heightening the tension until it blows to a crescendo when the joke showed, shows up at Bruce's fundraiser for Dent. He fires a shotgun, it all ends at that moment, doesn't it? Fantastic. Exactly. Wonderfully constructed. A similar thing happens at the commissioner's funeral. The whole thing builds to an almost unbearable outcome before the reveal of the Joker in the firing squad. And we get that tantalising, very, very short tantalising look at the Joker without the makeup. Oh, yeah. Music plays a huge part as Nolan heaps kind of jeopardy on top of jeopardy on top of jeopardy in these moments. And the payoff is always satisfying. Mm -hmm. And what I think is impressive is that Nolan makes things very clear. Who's who and what's going on. Really important to me, that. Yeah. And it sounds like um, directing 101, but with this material, it'd be easy to get lost in it and I never feel like I've missed anything, unlike some of his later films, which do make my head hurt a little bit. <laughs> we know this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing, though, um, uh, yeah, slight negative, the sonar thing near the end, that takes me out of it a little yeah. Kind of disappointing for me. That's when I think, think the film sags a little. But he does bring it back at the end with that magnificent Orman voiceover and the visual of Batman. Oh, so top work from Nolan, particularly those incredible intercut sequences that have like filled with tension. So, yeah, great. Yeah, I think this is classic Nolan. It looks it and feels big and powerful. Great collaboration with his DP, Wally Fister. A fantastical concept that he ground as much as possible. And massive action blockbuster that's a bit of a master class in big practical effects that's mm. all classic northern stuff and what i find interesting are his influences for the film i know that the first four days of production on the dark knight he didn't shoot anything he used those days to screen films that he wanted to emulate to the cast and crew any guesses of what those films might have been that he showed the cast and crew heat heat <laughs> of course <laughs> Ford, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> heat eight times <laughs> <laughs> No, Heat was one. Also, Cat People, Citizen Kane, yep. King Kong, the original, I assume, not the Peter Jackson one, yeah. Black <laughs> Sunday, A Clockwork Orange, Starlight 17, and Batman Begins. God, one, of <laughs> one of mine. One no of phrase, mine. no phrase. <laughs> yeah. how, how, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> how's, how's that get in there? Who put that one in there? <laughs> May as well put it now. on now, we'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> sit down, sit down, we're watching it. <laughs> so yeah, Heat and Michael Mann is an obvious influence, but I also think you can see Stanley Kubrick in there. I yeah. think you can see Francis Ford Coppola in there. I think you can see mm, Martin definitely. Scorsese in there. But Nolan blends all of it and twists all of it, so The Dark Knight still feels like a Nolan film. I think it's one of the great movie sequels, I think it's one of the great action movies, and I think it's the greatest superhero film as well. Wow. Very nice. And Westy, what about yourself? I mean, uh, yeah, I just have to echo all of the comments that have already been made. I mean, it's just, it's such an enjoyable film. And the great thing about this is I, I watched it again over the weekend and I just realised how great it is being a Batman film that's not necessarily about Batman. Like, Nolan mm -hmm, doesn't really mm -hmm. care about Batman at all in this. And the way he pushes that direction and the way he shows you the city is more of a character. It's about Gotham City, this film. And I think one of the main reasons that this works is because of Wally Fister's work on it and I don't think people talk about him enough and the decision that Nolan makes where he, he just walks up to the DP and goes I want to shoot this on IMAX so it's just like do you know how hard that is he's like yeah well I want to <laughs> shoot you know scenes of this on IMAX only four cameras existed four IMAX cameras wow. existed in the world Incredible. and one of them was destroyed on this production <laughs> so it's just like <laughs> that's how much of a risk he's taken and that's how much he cares about the final product, and I think Wally Fister here just does an incredible job of blending mm. all of them influences to look the same. We're going to break the 180 mm. degree rule, we're going to move the camera when we need to, we're going to have static shots when we need to, we're going to have incredible close-ups on an IMAX camera, so it's the biggest frame you could possibly find for this face. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think he's just incredible. Image maximum on the screen, and Nolan kind of pioneered that. <laughs> it's incredible, an incredible piece of work. Yeah, the whole film isn't shot in IMAX, is it? It's 37 no, no, minutes. No, no, just certain, of the yeah, certain yeah, sequences, yeah. yeah. Which you can tell, because it goes letterbox yeah. and then it goes full screen, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Another way that The Dark Knight was a, a pioneer and influenced future blockbusters was the way it was marketed online. Mm -hmm. yeah. For a whole, like, 15 months before it came out, Warner's ran a campaign called Why So Serious, I'm sure. We lived through it, you can remember yeah, it. Yeah. Remember it, yeah. Yeah. In that campaign, they shared online pamphlets of Harvey Dent running for office and the Joker's amendments to those pamphlets. Mm -hmm. They sent out $11,001 bills that the Joker had graffitied. <laughs> 
and there was a website for Gotham Cable News, which was obviously you see that in the film, and also the I Believe in Harvey Dent campaign. Yeah. My favourite part, they delivered Gotham City pizzas and cakes <laughs> sent by the Joker. Lovely. <laughs> I'm all up for that. Imagine if it was hot dogs. Wouldn't even, you wouldn't even be here. <laughs> oh, great. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> and they created alternative reality games that would lead to the first image of the Joker being released and a first look at the trailer. 15 months of work, it paid off. Yeah. Yeah, it did. I mean, I remember the image of the Joker being everywhere yeah. before it came out and thinking that he was iconic before the film was even released. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's that teaser poster where he's just so ballsy to have why so serious, but he's completely out of focus behind the glass. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you just see his outline. You just think, wow, I need to see this film immediately. Amazing. And also, after the film came out, Christopher Nolan and Warner Brothers were threatened with a lawsuit by a Turkish mayor called Hussein Kalkan, who was the mayor of a city called Batman. He said the film caused a negative impact on his city and said there's only one Batman in the world, which I think we can all agree with, surely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bob Kane's invention. And Bill Finger, don't forget him. Of course, yes, sorry. <laughs> Needless to say, the lawsuit went nowhere. Obviously. But Christopher Nolan on The Dark Knight lived up to expectations that he'd set by Batman Begins, I think. Surpassed them, I think. Absolutely. Like he surpassed everything yeah. he did Benchmark. before this. Amazing. Yeah. Agreed. Picking up nine months after the events of Batman Begins, the story for The Dark Knight was conceived by Christopher Nolan and David Goya and the screenplay written by Nolan and his brother, Jonathan. Nolan and Goya had written the screenplay for Batman Begins and this was the Nolan second collaboration in a row after co-writing The Prestige together in 2006. Mm -hmm. How good is the writing here though on The Dark Knight, Westy? Well, David Goya turned around and said he can't believe that his name was attached to this because it was that good. So like, <laughs> I kind of neither can I. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll reflect that. I think um, I'm surprised. <laughs> I think Chris and Jonathan Nolan just did it. You can tell they they just work so well together, and they kind of read each other's minds. I know he drew a lot of inspiration from, as we said earlier, from Heat, where that LA is a character in that film, and it's people existing within that character, within the the parameters of that city. And just the destruction of the city as well and how that's been torn down. It's got a real 9-11 kind of vibe. It always just seems to have this incredible tone where it's very mature and very accomplished. And I think that's Chris Nolan through and through. I think he's just a very mature, very accomplished filmmaker. Probably a very mature, very accomplished man. Probably the opposite of me. But that's why... <laughs> <laughs> and trying to make a superhero mm. film mm. so realistic is such a bombastic achievement but then again, a ridiculous concept to kind of think you could pull it off. Halfway there with Begins, I think. It's still quite Burton-esque in places. still quite comic book. Yeah. It still mm -hmm. lends itself to a little bit of fantasticalness. This definitely doesn't. It's just 100%. If Does that happen? Will that happen in real life? And I think that is down to the writing. It's brilliant. Yeah, I think at its best, the writing is very good. The narrative moves along really quickly. The characters and the character relationships are all well drawn out. And they're not afraid to take us to some dark places with the death of Rachel. Yeah. It has yeah. some thematic depth too. I think the overriding theme is chaos, where the joke has aim is yeah. to break down the societal structures of Gotham and cause anarchy. He calls himself an agent of chaos. Duality and choice are also strong themes. The Joker makes it clear that he sees himself and Batman as two sides of the same coin. Yeah. To them, you're just a freak. Like me. We have a dark knight and a white knight. Two faces the personification of duality. Batman has to choose between Rachel and Dent. And the very scene at the end is all about choice. I mean, that's all excellent stuff, I think. I do think as well, though, that there's so much story in there. It's bursting at the seams with plot points that there are some mm -hmm. plot holes as well. Right. Actually, a few, I think. Okay. But the one that I always notice is at the fundraising party where the Joker throws Rachel out the window. Mm -hmm. Batman jumps after her and saves her. And then they're on the car and we just cut to the next scene. I mean, mm -hmm. what happened to the party? Yeah. The Joker's up there with a load of hostages, surely. Don't care about that, though. <laughs> So there's stuff like that here and there all the way through. So the writing is usually good, sometimes excellent, but also with a plot hole here and there, it's sometimes, I think, a bit poor as well, but not poor enough to detract from nah, the film for no, me. No. On the whole, mm. I'd say it's good. Yeah. And Luke, what do you think of the writing? I really like the balance of tone in the film. Um, one thing that was guaranteed on release when The Dark Knight was reviewed 
was the mention of how dark the film is. That was the buzzword, really dark, really dark. Mm. And I, I do love that. The darker, the better for me. Obviously, Wester, you yeah. the same. Um, but there's got to be some relief to make you come back. Not for and me. that um, and this <laughs> <laughs> no, no relief for Westy. Three <laughs> hours miserable. <laughs> I think this film has the perfect balance of that with some nice humour sprinkled in. Hi. And I think the two characters who balance the overall tone of the film with their character are Alfred and Lucius, for me yes. anyway. Yeah. Alfred always on hand with a bone dry quip. Yeah, but never time. far away from, <laughs> <laughs> loves it loves it but he's never far away from like a morality tale for Bruce but also his exposition a ruby the size of a tangerine okay. yeah. brilliant <laughs> my two dads aren't they <laughs> <laughs> brilliant and added to that he carries quite a lot of emotional heft with his knowledge of Rachel's intentions before she died with the letter so, and he holds that close to his heart while he holds it away from Bruce. Mm-hmm. And with that, Lucius, there's a lot more lightness to him. He's like Q from Bond, isn't he? Desmond yeah. Llewellyn. He's... Pay attention, 007. Yeah. Pay attention, Bruce. Straight yeah. in there. <laughs> but he does put his foot down with the sonar stuff, and there is some emotion behind his resignation at the end. Yeah. So, for me, I think they reflect the tone of the film. Then there's the obvious lightness with Bruce Wayne's gallivant and about town. But the humour is all mostly dark and generally involving the Joker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At its best. Yeah. And I think this is a key factor in making the film what it is. If you compare this to other dark crime films recently, Prisoners, for example. Mm-hmm. Dark, dark, dark. No laughs at all. Zero. A great film, but I never feel like I want to rewatch that because I'm yeah. just going to get dragged down for two hours 45. Mm. And the yeah. same with the latest Batman, a huge runtime, three hours, pretty much humorless again. Mm. Again, it's a great film, but if there's a choice between the Batman and the Dark Knight, I mean, it's TDK every time. Yeah. If I do have an issue, it's in the ending for the Joker. I know he's, he's engineered this whole thing with Dent to create anarchy. But what's he going to do? Like live his whole life in a padded cell, knowing that he's unleashed Two-Faced onto the world. Is that his ideal outcome? Because it's not mine. He's not going to be able to see the fruits of his labour. Maybe that's because it's in the performance for the Joker. He's such a great character, but I just wanted something more satisfactory Mm. from that character. So a slightly sour note for me, because overall I like the writing and particularly the tone of it. Batman was almost 70 years old by this point, but this was only the sixth Batman film, and most of those other ones hadn't taken themselves very seriously, so they were decades worth of stories and comic books that the films hadn't touched, like a gold mine for the Nolans to plunder, and they did take mm. some inspiration from the books. They went back to Batman number one, where the Joker's motivation isn't money or power, he just wants to cause public disorder, and with that in mind, Nolan actually brought in one of the guys who created the Joker back in 1940, Jerry Robinson, the actor's consultant. Wow. The whole idea of one bad day being enough to bring someone down to the Joker's level is taken from The Killing Joke by Alan Moore, as is the way the Joker mm. tells contradictory stories about his past, as if he doesn't know the truth himself. You want to know how I got these scars? There's a book called The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb, and the story's different, but the Gordon Dent Batman triumvirate who take on the bad guys is taken straight from that. So and That's amazing. Cherry-picking from decades worth of source material, but the majority of The Dark Knight was brought to the table by the Nolans and David Goya, mm. and their work is right, as we think. Very good, on the whole. Top-notch. Yeah, very accomplished. Much of the cast for The Dark Knight were returning from Batman Begins with some new additions too. There's quite a few of them and we're going to talk in detail about our three leads. Christian Bale as Batman, Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent and Heath Ledger as the Joker. Right. So, Westy, what do you think of Christian Bale in the title role? He's great, isn't he? He kind of takes a back seat and he knows he is and I think he tries to, to really push the film along without trying to be like, well, I'm Batman and it really... Yeah, that's the first film. I'm Batman. Yeah, that's the first one. He's done that. He's, he's got it. He's already there. We already know who he is. <laughs> what people don't mention, I think he's a really incredible Bruce Wayne. Mm. And I think that's really hard to pull off, to do that duality. I think Michael Keaton's probably the only one for me where that really works and it's really believable. I'm Batman. But I think in Batman Begins, he's kind of confused about who Bruce Wayne is. In this one, he's definitely not. Like He knows how tortured he is. And I think he has more fun playing Bruce Wayne than he does playing Batman here. And the most notable thing for me is that his voice was really gruff in the first one. It was really kind of intense. And Nolan kind of got that and just let him roll with it. But then in post made his voice even more gritty and a bit more bassy. 
And I think Bale understood that and, and pulls it off. It's a really complex thing to do, but I think he does it really, really well, especially the interrogation scene. I mean, you can see that's kind of Bruce Wayne talking. You're garbage. You kills for money. It's just brilliant. Yeah, I think he's, he's really good, a really accomplished Batman, and for me, a very close second to Michael Keaton. Mm. Yeah, Batman's voice is one of the things the film gets criticised for a bit, isn't it? Well, any anything Nolan does with anyone's Quite voice right. is criticised. Anything he does with any sound design is criticised. That's a lovely, lovely voice. Just deal with it. It's <laughs> what he wanted. Just deal, Just with, deal it. with it. It's, it's, what he's, it's his vision. Don't be like everything's incredible, but these voices just a, isn't really right, is it? Well, you do it then. <laughs> <laughs> if it's that easy, it's that easy. You just, you just do it. <laughs> well, Batman has a new suit in this film as well. It's just much more flexible yeah. than the one in Batman Begins because he couldn't even turn his head in that one, which was yeah. ridiculous. Mm. But still, better than the George Clooney monstrosity. Remember that one from Batman and Robin? Oh, yeah, Bad nibbles. Yeah. Awful my Bad nibbles. That. I've, got to, I've, I've watched that <laughs> far too many times because my son loves it. It's really accessible for him. But oh my God. You are not sending me to the corner. Bale trained in martial arts for the film. Nolan wanted Batman as a trained ninja to use actual real fighting style. So they did some research and decided on a style called Keezy because it's effective against multiple attackers. And like amazing when he rips through those guys in the park and oh, yeah. start those spinning elbows. Yeah. Awesome. He also did some of his own stunts. Christian Bale, like in the Hong Kong sequence, that's really Bale standing on that skyscraper about 100 stories wow. up. Incredible. Wow. For my cast member, I've taken on Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Two-Face tend to talk about. Right. Brave man. Me, yeah, mainly because I'm fairly sure that you two don't like him and I wanted to give him a fair crack of the whip. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. He, That's good he go. <laughs> so, I, so I did give him a fair crack of the whip okay. and I don't like him. Yeah, I don't like him either. <laughs> I like Two-Face as a character. I like the journey that Nolan takes him on and I don't think Eckhart's acting is bad as such. No, it's the not. The problem is I don't like the character on a personal level. Even at the start, I find Dent so arrogant and so smug. Yeah. And the problem is, I don't think I'm meant to. Surely the idea is that we <laughs> like Dent, so when he becomes two-faced, it's tragic and we feel sadness at the end. At yeah. the end, I feel nothing towards him, to be honest. Yeah, I agree. I know the first person that Nolan wanted as Dent was Matt Damon, but he couldn't do it because he was making Invictus. And I think Damon would have sorted all that right out. Yeah, he, he would have pulled off the smugness. He would have liked him. And it would have been really sad to see him lose literally everything that he has. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think the writing of the character is really, really good, but Aaron Eckhart is the poorest of the three leads for me. Poor man's Matt Damon. Easily. Very poor. <laughs> Crap Damon. <laughs> poor man's Matt Damon. <laughs> I recommend you buy American. As well as Damon, some other names that Nolan considered for Dent were Hugh Jackman, Liev Schreiber, and Mark Ruffalo. Obviously, Ruffalo that's, would have been amazing. that's a winner for yeah. me. Ruffalo, amazing. Any of those guys are better than Eckhart for me, I, and I'm not a fan of Hugh Jackman. I agree, huge, yeah. Yeah, huge action. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Ruffalo would have been great. A little dicky bow tie in there. Oh, awesome. <laughs> oh Mac! <laughs> I don't think I could have handled it when he turned into Two-Face. I think that would have been too painful. Exactly, I, I could, exactly. I could, yeah. That's the point, that. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I do know that Eckhart did some research for the role and took inspiration from Bobby Kennedy, who back in the 60s, as Attorney General, took on a mob, tried to crack down on organised crime, and Mm -hmm. he he tried to bring that realism to it and also studied people who had a split personality disorder and tried to understand that. But I just think you can see Mm -hmm. from his research he's trying to approach it right, but I just don't think he, he executes it as well as he could. Yeah, I think that all sounds brilliant, all those influences, but I don't really see any of that in the performance, to be honest. He just seems to shout a lot to me. (laughs) Also, when we're in the hospital, how does Dent not realise that's the Joker until he takes his mask off? It's absolutely (laughs) ridiculous. It's the most identifiable (laughs) arch criminal in the whole of Gotham. And he's got a tiny little surgical (laughs) mask. Matilda (laughs) on his his living tag. Yeah. He'd have been loving Cobra the Joker, getting away with all sorts. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> uh, for Eckhart's appearance as Two Face, Nolan's plan was originally to use makeup, but he changed his mind because he wanted to take away from Eckhart's face, not add to it, so CGI was used instead. Right. And the way yeah. that was achieved was that Eckhart acted all the scenes as normal, and for each shot, three cameras were set up at different angles to capture each side of his face. He wore markers on his face and a prosthetic skull cap which the CGI engineers then used to position the effect on top. I mean, it's the main use of CGI in the film, and 
I'm not blown away by it, nah, to be I honest. It. I hate it. I find mm. it incredibly difficult to believe that someone mm. can be that badly injured and then just function. <laughs> you can see his skull. <laughs> yeah, there's like, there's, yeah. bits of, there's like a little <laughs> bit of blood on the on the pillow and he's got no anaesthetic. He's been given yeah. no drugs to kind of deal with it. That's not explained whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. He's waking up, half his face is burnt off and he's just kind of like, ah, I'll flip this coin. <laughs> but that's the thing. Yeah. It's like the realism that this film's based in loses it completely with Harvey Dent as a character. I mean, get Rick Baker in there, do something mm-hmm. half as good as what he did on mm-hmm. American Werewolf, and you've got me bought in. None of that was put into place. It's kind of like, we've got everything good enough, he's you know he's going to die anyway, fine. Yeah, I mean, he's meant to be two-faced, not half a face, which is what we say here. It's too yeah, much. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Luke, saving the best till last... Not you. I mean, he's Ledger as the Joker. Obviously. <laughs> well, both. Well, Ledger, Ledger, and me. <laughs> both. There you go, Westy. <laughs> the best man talking about the best man. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about the one and only Heath Ledger as, jo- as the Joker. Um, Nolan wanted him after seeing him his performance mm-hmm. in Brokeback Mountain. He knew this was yeah. the guy. <laughs> you watch no. Brokeback Mountain. There's yeah. the Joker. Yeah, yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that's the joker right there <laughs> his scenes are the yeah. best in the film for me considering how loathsome he is as well that's quite incredible to pull off um, the marketing t-shirts like I mentioned they were all sold on the back of the film they weren't Batman mm-hmm. they were this guy and Ledger is just incredible worth the hype his first proper scene I know we've got the bank heist scene but first proper scene when we really learn about this guy the pencil oh, trick yeah. scene oh yeah He's doing his speech, and and as for the television's plan, he'll, he'll find him, him and, and make him squeal. squeal. When he snakes out of that room, pulling yeah. at the string of the grenade, he is my card. Just completely irresistible yeah. stuff, that. That's incredible. Uh, although that isn't Joker's first scene, the bank heist is all about Nolan's genius. This scene is all on Ledger's performance, and it's magnificent. And it sets the bar on what we're going to get for the rest of his performance. He massively over-delivers. The character is just so tantalising and completely enigmatic. I love that he's got different stories for how he got the scars. Mm -hmm. Adds to the complexity and unpredictability of the character. So uh, a faultless performance and one of the best in recent times for me, comic book or not. Yeah, it's fantastic. That scene with the pencil trick as well. Have you noticed how similar that is to that scene in The Crow? You might not watch The Crow as often as I do. I watch it weekly. (laughs) But there's that great scene. He (laughs) comes in at the end with with all the mob that are sat around the table and he comes in and kind of sits on the table and dresses them down. It's a very, very similar Mm. kind of shot for shot. The way, the way it works, mm. like, that's fantastic as well, where he's pulling influences from. Yeah, I mean, he's sensational. He was getting huge praise for his performance as soon as the film came out. He was instantly iconic. He was always the first person that Nolan had in mind to play the Joker, his ledger, but apparently Paul Bettany was lined up in case it fell through. Yeah, um, yeah. And the auditions wow. came down to three people, Ledger, Hugo Weaving, and Sam Rockwell. Right? Right, Rockwell, yeah, good. And apparently Nolan said to Rockwell, if I ever do the Riddler, the part yours. Well, I'm never doing the Riddler, though. Never doing the Riddler. How harsh is that? <laughs> I'm going to do Bane instead. What the fuck? <laughs> now get out. <laughs> and Norman actually said there was Ledger who pursued him about playing the part and said that when they met, he and Ledger both understood the character in exactly the same way. In preparation for the character alleged when method, De Niro style, he hid himself in a motel room for about six weeks and in that time he developed the Joker's voice, his laugh and his walk and he kept a diary which heavily references A Clockwork Orange, you mentioned it earlier, and the main character in that film, Alex DeLarge, and his voice sounds quite a lot like Tom Waits as well. Oh, it really does. That's a great mm. clip. Let's, mm. let's play mm. it now. I have a growing level of popularity uh, throughout the... Uh, Intercontinental United States, uh, Japan, and uh, I travel extensively in Europe as well. Depending on the time, he may be in one spot or several. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> and he also bought cheap makeup and designed the Joker's look himself. He was influenced by Francis Bacon, obviously. obviously. You know, a natural selection. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> he painted Roll some me. distorted, <laughs> surreal portraits. And once yeah. Nolan approved the design, the makeup team would then recreate it every day. But if you look carefully, you can see dried red and white makeup on the Joker's fingers and under his fingernails after yeah. he's obviously yeah. applied it himself to his face. Lovely touch, yeah. that. You can see that Amazing. in the hospital as well when he's kind of like 
he grabs the gun and stuff. It's just fantastic. But his mm-hmm. costume design as well as the costume designer was Lindy Hemming. Nolan was um, telling her that he wanted to imagine what the Joker smells like. This is something that I always come back when I've talked to you guys. Not necessarily on here. I was like, I can smell that film. I can smell that yeah. guy. But he kind yeah. of based his look on like rock stars like Johnny Rotten, Iggy Pop, Sid Vicious, you know, Pete Doherty. You can kind of get that vibe. Right? He fucking stinks, doesn't he? Spot the odd man yeah. out there. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> Doherty, obviously. <laughs> Eating a massive fry up like Doherty. Yeah. Got to do yeah. it now, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> the porker. <laughs> Yeah, he's got the scars as well, the Joker, and they were created with prosthetics mm. and they actually kept coming unstuck and Ledger had to lick them back into place and that's where yeah. the Joker's tick comes from, where he licks his lips. Ledger sort of oh, made something geez. of it, which is great. Oh, wow. Well, hello, beautiful. That's I mean, to make something like that is just ridiculous. It kind of yeah. just like anyone else would have just been really pretentious being like, this isn't working, can you stick it on properly, please? But he's kind of like, <laughs> makes it into the character. Yeah, great. Which is great. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah, amazing. Apparently Ledger's ambition was to be a director and he was given the opportunity, directed both of those homemade videos that the Joker shoots in the film. The fake Batman one and the one at the end where the reporter reads the Joker's statement. His performance in those those bits where he's got particularly the phony Batman captive, Mm. that's completely chilling. It's like a horror movie. Look at me! That line. Oh, God. And he's laugh as well. When he's hitting them and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's probably the only part of the film where I'm terrified of him. Hmm. Like All the other bits, I'm like, I feel like I'm standing up because it's been directed by Nolan and you've got this kind of almost a laminate in front of you, this beautiful scene where he just looks great and it's beautifully lit. But then bits, you just go, this guy is horrible. Yeah. He's yeah, awful. Horrendous. We mentioned earlier how Warner's used the internet to its advantage by creating a viral marketing campaign, but when Ledger was cast in 2006, the internet went into meltdown with people (laughs) losing their minds about it. I'm sure you remember. Yes. Ridiculous. A bunch of absolute clowns moaning about. I think it's fair to say they were all proved wrong. Yes, 100%. 100%, yeah, definitely. Before we finish on the cast, we have a question from one of our patrons. So one benefit of many of being in All The Right Movies patron is that we'll answer your questions on the show. And Matt Lum has a question for us. So take it away, Matt. Hi, guys. I'm really pleased you're covering The Dark Knight. It's one of my favourite Chris Nolan films. And for me, it's one of the best sequels of all time. My question for you is... Who do you think was the better Joker? Who did you prefer? Was that Heath Ledger in Dark Knights or Joaquin Phoenix in The Joker? Uh, for me, it's the former, but I uh, can't wait to hear your thoughts. <sighs> Big question. Thanks for that, Matt. Mm-hmm. Mm. What do you think, Westy? I think I had to find a reason for my answer. I couldn't just give an answer. I had to find a really good reason to kind of differentiate these two characters. Okay. And I would say I love them both, and they both brought something brand new to the character that I always wanted to see throughout my whole life. You know, I wanted to see the the birth of the Joker, and I wanted to see just how archaic he could have been. But I have to say that I prefer Ledger because he's the fully-fledged Joker, and you don't know where he's come from. He Mm. has this mystery to his character, and he plays on that, and you don't know where the scars came from. All (laughs) these stories are different. His performance kind of reflects Mm. that. So for me, that's a harder thing to pull off because he has not got that backstory and neither have the audience where I think with Phoenix's Joker you know where he's coming from you know his background you know his mental health situation but I would rather watch Heath Ledger's performance as someone who knows that they're the Joker and they're you know given it in the film than someone who isn't always going to be fully fledged I think yeah Mm. he is brilliant and Luke what about you yeah well firstly disappointed there's no love for Cesar Romero in there from Matt very disappointing (laughs) stuff (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think Phoenix is is a fantastic joke, a real tortured performance and a descent into chaos. But I'm going with Ledger for similar reasons, Westy. The obvious choice for Mm -hmm. me, 
the reason that the character is fully formed, fully realised at the Joker, and because he's fully realised, Ledger gets to explore all the mania that comes with that, which is a lot more fun to see than Phoenix's very, very painful descent. But standalone, Ledger every time. There is a wider cast of characters in the film. Some big names too. Gary Oldman as Jim Gordon, Maggie Gyllenhaal yeah. as Rachel Dawes, Michael Caine as Alfred, and Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox are all valuable. But in those main three, they lead the film very well. Or oh, two of them do anyway. Yeah. Two, two out of three, of course. Yeah. yeah. With Dent, you've got to uh, you've got to endure. <laughs> <laughs> We've mentioned a few key moments in The Dark Knight already, and now is the time we talk in more detail about our highlights in the movie. So, Westy, what are you going for as your highlight? I'll go for the highlight that actually hit home the first time I saw it, and is just an incredible, incredible sequence, and I can watch it as a short film in itself. And it's the opening of the film. Mm. I just think that just the way it opens with that, that score, it's so clever as a heist that I hadn't seen it before, where actually the robbers of the heist are killing each other. There's chaos yeah. within organisation, yeah. and that's the Joker. It's just explaining his whole plan all the way through. Brilliant. I mean, if you look at the motifs that, that Nolan uses and Fister uses, you, you're moving in on a building, and then you should just cut inside the building and then see them shoot out. But you see the window blow out from the outside to show that the, the destruction of the city, to show that Gotham is a victim. You get the second blast from William Fitchner, who's another nod to Heat because he used the same character. Yeah, yeah. He blows the glass away and the glass blows all over the bank. And then the third motif of the glass is when the, the bus drives in and blows away. It's just basically the city's being destroyed. Everything around them is being destroyed as the Joker's wiping out who he needs to wipe out. I've seen so many films, but I haven't seen anyone give someone a hand grenade and just pull the pin out and tell them to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> if you watch it again and put it on the screen, every single piece of action that happens is slightly off to the right. The safe is on the right-hand side. The putting the phone on and the smashing the lock off is on the right-hand side of the frame. Very it's, nice. it's pretty much mirrored as you go all the way through, so he keeps you in touch with what's going on. And then that reveal of the Joker... Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. And one of the main things as well is that mask that was worn by Ledger was the same mask that Cesar Romero wore when the Joker was introduced in the 60s comic book oh, series. Wow. <laughs> Speaking of the masks, have you seen the concept art for the Joker's gang in the clown masks? Even that looks fantastic. And it translates to the film really well. There's a consistent opening to all of Nolan Batman films in that immediately before the film starts, we're always shown the bat symbol. And yeah, each yeah. time, the symbol foreshadows what happens in that particular film. So yeah. in Batman Begins, there's a colony of bats. And in the film, Bruce Wayne turns his fear of bats into becoming Batman. In Rises, the symbol is surrounded by brick and ice. And in the film, Bane breaks Batman's back. And in this film, yeah. the bat symbol engulfed in flames because... Some men just want to watch the world burn. Very yeah. nice. I love that. Also, yeah. the building which they use as the bank was a real post office, and the bit where the bus crashes yeah. through the wall, they had to take the bus apart and then reassemble it inside the post office, and then they hid it behind a false yeah. wall and then use an air cannon to shoot it backwards through the wall. Just great wow. practical effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. it is it, it wouldn't fit normally would it so that would build like yeah. a wall for it to, to, to fit in properly here and it's great when he's like I killed the bus driver yeah it is one of the great action opening sequences I think and yeah. any nod to the 60s TV series always welcome oh, of yeah. course and Luke what's your highlight in the movie I'm going for the scene where Dent identifies himself as the Batman and gets taken away in the SWAT van oh very oh, nice massive yeah huge just an awesome spectacle. Uh, I love the drop in sound right at the start. It's kind of like a helicopter shot. And all you can hear is the distant whir of the helicopter and Zimmer's score just in the background. And then the truck on fire is just visually incredible. As is the other SWAT van being taken out from nowhere, straight into the river. Bang! Yeah. Nolan makes the whole thing just so visual, even down to the blackly funny joke on the side of the truck. Slaughter is the best medicine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. why would the Joker go to those lengths just for a laugh? He's changing <laughs> one letter again, just one letter, the same as yeah. he's done in the opening sequence. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Great. And when he's being handed bigger and bigger guns until he breaks out the bazooka. What is that, a bazooka? Hilarious. Is that a bazooka? <laughs> <laughs> Nicky Cotton, he's great. Yeah. <laughs> Things like the Joker chuntering away to himself, Harvey, 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 Harvey Dent. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's just amazing. 
<laughs> and, and Batman on the bat pod with his uh, cape blown behind him is just a cool looking aesthetic. So yeah, yeah. these are really small details, but really make a lasting mm. impression. Actually, when the Batmobile comes in this, onto the scene, the Chicago Police Department received a lot of calls from several concerned citizens claiming that the police were involved in a high-speed pursuit with a dark vehicle of unknown make. <laughs> of course, it was unknown. Yeah. I mean, I would, be, I would be very surprised if one, not one of them didn't say it. It, it actually looks like a Batmobile. Yeah. I think the tumblers in Chicago. <laughs> There's a motorbike just sprung from the front of it. Yeah. Lead somebody down here. And finally, it's a beautiful triple cross when the Joker gets done at the end of the sequence. He stamps on one of his goons who gets electrocuted when he tries to take the mask off, and he spits on him. Just crazy. Yeah. Um, but the Joker thinks that he has Batman, but it was all a ruse all along. And who's the guy that's got him? It's Gordon, the true golden boy of Gotham, back from the dead. Amazing, we can all breathe a yeah. sigh of relief. Well, at least for a minute anyway. Yeah, he asks him for like oh, a few more minutes. He's like, have a few more minutes. Let's have another minute just to check out what he's got. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, I think it's one of the great car chases, this. Not just spectacle for the sake of it. There's a, a narrative to it. But again, there's some fantastic practical effects work on show. When you see behind the scenes footage, the big explosions, the vehicle crashes, it's all in camera. There's loads of miniature work as well, miniature to the SWAT vans, the trucks, yeah. the tumbler. Best toys ever, those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And most impressive of all has to be the moment where the 18-wheeler truck flips over. I mean, for oh, years, yeah. yeah, I always assumed it was CGI. If not, I thought it must have been scale models or something, but it's not mm -hmm. either. They really flipped over an actual 18-wheeler truck, which just blows my mind incredible like, yeah it's like flipping an at that <laughs> <laughs> well the special effects supervisor was chris corbold and when northern told him what he wanted to do corbold tried to persuade him to flip something smaller and northern agreed to do one of the swat vans instead but then he came back nice. a couple of days later and said actually no it has to be the 18 wheeler mm. so Corbold and his team built a rig that fits on the underbelly of the truck, and on that rig was a huge piston that the driver would trigger to shoot out the bottom to make the truck flip. And to get the piston to shoot out with enough force, they had to detonate it with TNT, and they then reinforced the cab with steel so the driver could stay in the truck as it was flipped. I mean, it's the moment in the film that I always pay total attention to. I don't think it gets talked about enough, to be honest. I mean, is no, it just me, or is no. it just completely insane? Oh, it's, it's incredible. Insane. Money it's insanely shot. good. Yeah, and the music cuts out. It's just, yeah, oh, yeah. just them sound yeah, effects. Rah, and you're just mm. like, eh, yeah. okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, for my highlight, I'm going for the whole interrogation and rescue sequence. Batman faces the Joker in the cell, again, surely inspired by the yes. restaurant scene in Heat. Ledger yes, is sensational in this scene. Mm. The way Nolan crosses the 180 degree line to signify the Joker getting inside Batman's head, that's some visual storytelling. And mm. Hans Zimmer's rising score that plays in the background romping up the tension is brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it's two guys in an empty room and it's all just so cinematic. Fantastic. Oh, magnificent. And then the chase to rescue Rachel and Dent, Nolan sets up a classic superhero trope. I've seen loads of times where Superman's given a choice to save a bus full of kids or Lois Lane and he ends up saving both. Yeah, the Joker mm. gives Batman a choice, Rachel or Dent. He chooses Rachel, but she dies, and Dent becomes Two-Face and dies. So Batman doesn't actually save anyone. He completely fails. I mean, he ends, up, exactly, he ends up beating the Joker, but he has to lose everything to do so, which I think is just great yeah. writing. I think that's that a brilliant nod back to the original Superman as well, because he chooses to save the kids and then doesn't really save Lois, and then has to turn the world around to yeah. save her. So he does mm -hmm. fail, mm -hmm. and that death of Rachel is quite reminiscent of that. I think yeah. that's still an influence. There is a slight plot hole again. I mean, why is the policeman standing in the cell with the Joker? Get yeah. out. No need. Yeah. <laughs> For that insane dialogue back and forth, that's why. It's incredible. The dialogue is brilliant, yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I know. Yeah, I knew your friends better than you ever did. All that kind of stuff. It's yeah. just, oh, so cutting. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And that little look up. Would you like to know which of them were cowards? Bill said that during the interrogation scene, Ledger was so in character. He wanted Bale to hit him as hard as he could. I mean, crazy. <laughs> crazy. I wouldn't invite that at all. <laughs> Taylor guy. did. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, the scene originally ended with Batman kicking the Joker in the head right before he leaves. Have some of that, but it was it was sliced in editing because Nolan felt he, he was a little bit too petulant, right? For Batman, I mean, obviously, petty. Yeah, a big swing at the face. <laughs> going up. See you later. What's he going to say? There's got to be some line for that as well. Like, yeah. What can he possibly say that's going to be cool? Wouldn't work at all. But, I mean, you mentioned Hans Zimmer there. And I mean, the music is just incredible all the way through, and it's even yeah, it's more wild. incredible when it cuts out and gives the whole film space to breathe. But what Zimmer did, especially with the Joker's theme, he had some really strange methods. Like he, he played piano wires with razor blades to get that kind of vibe to it, and a guitar with shards of metal. Like it reminds me of what um, Toby Hooper did with the with the Texas Chainsaw soundtrack yeah, and had all right. these weird things knocking mm-hmm. about and just kind of just mm-hmm. dragging things across and making all these sounds that nobody had heard before and he kind of brings it back and he also based the theme on D and C the, co- the notes D and C for DC Comics which he didn't oh, have to do wow. that that's his <laughs> yeah, that's, that's he's just, lovely touch he's just taking a piss <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah the music's outstanding all the way through I think one of Zimmer's best you think it's up there. Yeah. That yeah, up this there. and Inception. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Inception's great. There's a few more moments we could have went with, but those three, all excellent. Oh, huge! Yeah. It's an excellent film. Mm. <laughs> Westy, you're up first, please. Your summary and score for The Dark Knight. All right, no pressure. Okay. Um, yeah, it's one of them. It, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a big film for me. It's one that stuck with me and one that really influenced us when I first saw it at the cinema. And I went with Matt, I think. I'm sure I did. Um, I, yeah, I definitely yeah. did. I remember the, the discussion on the way home when we spoke about it. All the way, it's about like a 25 minute drive back to his. And then I thought about it on the way. So it was a good half an hour like, to an hour thinking about it. Then texting when I got in, well, you think about it now? It was like one o'clock in the morning or something. <laughs> uh, and I think it was still the same now. Like, still, what do you think about it? Yeah, it's still, it's still as good. Um, and yeah, just one of them films where you kind of, if you see it with someone that you kind of really connect or if someone really enjoys the film, then you really enjoy it as well. I think from a superhero film point of view, it's flawless. It really brings that reality to it. It was such an influence on cinema. It was such an influence on IMAX. It was such an influence on visuals. And it was just uh, one of the big Mm. kind of landmarks for me in my cinema journey of just, you know, you have to see The Dark Knight. I mean, my kids aren't old enough to watch it yet, but I cannot wait because my son loves Batman. But when he sees this, he's going to really love Batman. Mm. He'd be like, what? Where did that come from? You know, (laughs) so... And that was the same for me. And I think to hit that hard and for people to still, I mean, it's analysed now. Every every film class, like I know New York Film School still teach this, especially the opening sequence and how you cut film, how things are done. It's up there. It's that mm. important. It's that important for me. People might argue the toss and say, well, it's too long. Or there's bits where it lags and there is plot holes and there is all that kind of stuff. But for me, nah, it's just thoroughly thoroughly enjoyable and a thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed coming back and watching it again twice over the last two days and i'm still not sick of it so for me i've yeah. done a run of these and it's going to be another 10 for me has to be <laughs> Massive. wowza huge yeah i mean we've been through a lot of stuff there because there's a lot to talk about this was yeah. one of the biggest films this century mm-hmm. made a superstar director of nolan arguably kickstarted the superhero genre to be the biggest one out there but i think this transcends the superhero genre I don't think this is just a classic superhero film. I think it's a classic film, full stop. Yeah. I love right. how it looks, yep. sweeping and epic. The action sequences are among the most spectacular we've ever seen, as is the practical effects work. Heath Ledger gives an iconic performance as the Joker, and I put it up there among the great movie sequels. Not Nolan's best film for me, but one of his definitive films, and yeah. almost certainly his most iconic film. The best superhero movie ever and for me it gets 9.5 out of 10 <gasps> oh, so just them plot out. holes bastard mm. <laughs> god damn those plot holes and look your summary and score for TDK please yes well obviously it's an amazing film hugely impressive feat of filmmaking from Christopher Nolan who stitches the whole narrative together in a really really enjoyable way full of suspense full of dread and it always keeps you guessing it just feels huge. Everyone cooking on the cast and crew bar and a few niggles, like, Eckhart, you know, yeah, yeah. Eckhart, for example. <laughs> the only example. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's become so embedded in recent popular culture that it has put me off watching it as often as I might have because it's always on in some form or another. It's always repeated on TV. It gets a fair amount of social media attention as well. Despite all of that, rewatching it for this was an mm. absolute joy. 
and you can't help but be blown away by no. Ledger's performance and no. I mean, that is incredible yeah. it's one timeless. of the very best so for me it also gets a big 9.5 out of 10 right. massive yes. so overall that leaves the Dark Knight with an impressive 29 out of 30 massive huge mm. And that's all we have this time around. If you like what we do on The Cutting Room, you can access bonus episodes of the show by supporting us on Patreon. You can also get access to over 200 hours worth of All The Right Movies podcasts and lots more. You can also get our podcast on our website. 79 pence per episode, which is a bargain, isn't it? Oof. Bargain. Absolute (laughs) bargain. Considering what goes into it. Uh, Considering the lengths we went to, and not just the lengths we went to, the length (laughs) of the entire recording. Yeah. Two and a half, some of them. Yeah. Mostly Westy. It's five pound eighty a pint nowadays. Yeah, it is mostly. Yeah. Look how many are on yeah. there. There's loads of them. That's at all the right movies dot com. But for now, we're going to say goodbye and thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yep. Thanks, guys. See you later on. What's happened to Luke? Well, the boss said when we finished the podcast, just to take care of him, it was one less cut. You know. Funny. He told me the same thing. That looks fucking shit. <laughs>